Hello and welcome back. In this video, we'll be looking at the Prince Rupert's Drop, a droplet of glass with explosive power and a hard temperament. It should be able to withstand a much higher amount of force than a normal piece of glass or marble. It's inspired a lot of curiosity and understanding in science, which I appreciate myself. And so this is my first attempt here. I'm gonna melt a droplet into some cold water, which should create some stressful internal forces in the droplet. Due to thermal expansion, most objects will expand and contract as they're warmed and cooled. Now it's normally hard to see, but a good example would be a liquid thermometer. That's how it works is by that liquid expanding by heat and then contracting as it cools. But if it happens too rapidly, then the material won't uniformly contract or expand. And then you get these layers of stress inside. And so I have to be careful not to drop this as it has explosive stress inside. Whoops, that was close. And now while I carefully retrieve my droplet, I'm gonna zoom in on these four candles you see here and ask you a simple question on perspective. Our perspective is how we see the world, sort of like a metaphorical window. Your device, the window you're looking at now, is giving you some more perspective on glass and science, so it's not a bad thing. And so let me ask, how many lights do you see here? You might say four lights. It looks like there's four lights there. But of course, it's only two. The Inner two lights are just refractions of the outer two. The glass of water in the middle is offering you a window you're not supposed to see. It's bending the light that's hitting it towards you. The image is also a bit distorted because of the shape of the vessel and ultimately our perspective as well as there's only two oil lamps there housed in a glass scale. And now it's time to run the test. Whoa! And so that right. was pretty cool. I've been lamp working nice. for a while, and so I've seen things, you know, come apart and pop into pieces and such, but not with that much explosive force. You know, I'm usually looking around my studio to pick up any chunks. Whoa. In this case, I couldn't find anything. And so that was with your everyday soda lime glass. But now I wanna try some different colors of soda lime. It might be easier to see on camera, the explosion. And then borosilicate as well, which is a hard glass. We'll see if that even works. And so this is your soda lime soft glass. It's the same thing bottles and windows are made out of. It is more temperamental to thermal stress compared to the hard glass but it does melt at a lower temperature, so it melts a bit more easily, which makes it favorable to produce household items because it'll take less energy to get it into form. And then plastic uses even less than that. It's also lighter as well. Unfortunately, it's not as recyclable and it takes a while to break down. So if we make too much, it's gonna kind of be everywhere like party confetti. It's kind of a complex situation with a lot of variables, which is normal in life. It's similar to the four light question that we looked at earlier. Looking out into the world, we're only presented one perspective. And so we have to consider multiple possibilities and kind of put ourselves in different places or in different people's shoes to see more of the truth. And so in my shoes, I didn't actually see as much in that video during that explosion of the droplet as you did. I was behind a face shield and it did happen quite fast. However, I did feel a shower of glass rush over my arms, which is an experience I can't have by just watching a video. And that's why I believe it's a good benefit to do the experiments yourself at home that way you can have a fuller experience of what's happening. In this case, you'd be lamp working. So there'd be a lot of safety information and preparation you have to do before you go down this journey. It's a hot path with plenty of occupational hazards. 
Now that I finished up with the colored droplets, I couldn't get any red or striking colors to work. They just kept breaking apart. And my blue and green did work about half the time. And now I've jumped over to the borosilicate hard glass. You'll notice this harder glass is taking longer to melt, but I did introduce it directly into the flame without any pops or cracks. Boro is very resistant to thermal stress, so a rod of this size normally won't have any problems. Of course, if you heat a small area and let it cool, that could induce enough stress that when you come back and reheat that area again, it could crack or pop. Sometimes when we work on larger projects, we have to keep reheating the entire piece again and again, just to keep it from getting to that cracking point. And so instead of just melting the glass off the rod, I gathered up a bit of glass there to make a larger droplet. And my biggest focus is just keeping an even heat all the way around. I don't want one side too hot or the center too cold. As we zoom in, we can see this red light representing the heat in the bulb that's quickly fading away. Plenty of bubbles from the heat, as well as this weird optical illusion of smoke or waves that's coming up and refracting the light. But now for one of the more stranger things, I kept seeing this bubble forming on the inside. I'm not quite sure what it is. My first guess is a cavitation bubble, which is a void or cavity in the water. But those are full of water vapor, and I don't think glass would vaporize like that. I know it's pressure related though, it has to do something with negative thermal expansion. The glass molecules shrink as they cool, which takes up less space, normally causing stress, but in this case a big bubble. My other guess is maybe some microscopic air got trapped in the boro when it was manufactured. And then the internal contracting forces caused it to expand. Air can definitely expand and contract quite a bit. I recommend checking out Thermo Expando. That was one of the videos that I had the most fun making, and I think the experiment turned out really well. But now I want to create a marble for you. That way you can see more of an extent of what these tools can do. I also haven't made a marble in a while, or worked with soft glass, so this is kind of a double treat. And you'll see, I just apply heat to the rod and then just keep rotating very evenly. And this will gather up into a nice even marble. Now I was actually having a harder time here compared to Boro as I was applying too much heat. The marble wants to just float right off the rod. It's too hot and there's not enough viscosity to keep it in place. It also takes longer to set up and become solid, so I have to keep rotating it longer than I normally would outside of the flame. I'm just applying some dots here. That and lines are a good way to start with marbles. And now you can definitely learn some more techniques like the vortex marble, but eventually you're going to have to break away and go down your own path. Which is not to say you can't base heavily off a known technique. Like the classic ribbon marble, you can put your own twist on it and then people will recognize it as a ribbon marble, but something new. Basically what I'm getting to is putting originality in your work. And I'm not sure quite what it is, but there's something special about an idea or a creation that didn't exist until you brought it into the universe. I don't know if it's proof that we're moving forward, proof of positive progress. I don't know. Um, other than it does inspire curiosity. I'll attach a temporary glass handle on the back called a punty in order to melt off the rod in the front. And then I'll start working on the lens, which is roughly about 50% of the sphere. And so half of the marble is clear glass, which is the shape of a magnifying glass. So anything below that, the other half, is going to look larger than it really is. But now going from boro, which I normally work in, and doing soda lime like this, I'm definitely overheating it all the time. 
there is that temperature difference between the two where the Boro needs that heat. And I, I usually do work pretty hot, which if you're working in the heat, you do need to be cautious about. You do need to stay hydrated, but also keep up on your electrolytes if you're sweating profusely. Some of the symptoms are weakness and fatigue, even to a point of mental confusion. So if you're that far out of balance, it's gonna be even harder to get what you need. And now I'll remove it from my punty and place it in the kiln to melt that stress away. You can set your annealing time for how large the marble is, something like one hour per half inch. And so a two inch marble would anneal for four hours but I believe it is dependent on your manufacturing methods. You know, if you don't allow a lot of cooling, then you might not need as much annealing. Whereas if you're bench cooling, you'll definitely need that extra time. I hung a 25 pound weight and placed a ruler behind it. You can see the glass rod doesn't stand a chance against this weight. And now this isn't the Prince Rupert's droplet. It's a normal marble in the shape of one that was annealed in the kiln. I'm doing my control test first, which seems to be holding up quite well. Look how high it's going. It's always good to do your wow. control. That way you have something to compare your finished data with. I have Prince Rupert's droplets and non Prince Rupert's droplets. And all of these so far are holding up amazingly well. I'm standing on this marble I made earlier. I went up to 50 pounds now. I'm having trouble breaking the control samples. I believe its strength is contributed to the spherical shape. You know, that allows it to most evenly distribute forces around the structure. And now finally, I'll switch over to the Prince Rupert's droplets and see if I can smash it without breaking the tail. And this was a very impressive hit. The more weight I use or the higher I lift it, the greater force we'll see applied to the droplet. And so at 50 pounds, this is the highest the weight has been lifted so far. Oh, and it looks like I smashed one, which is kind of unexpected. We should check the other camera, which will have a different perspective. It looked like the weight knocked it forward and then smashed the tail behind it. And so when you don't receive the results you're looking for, sometimes you do have to question your methods. And so this setup isn't gonna work for that delicate tail. I'm gonna have to come up with something else later, but I'll go ahead and pop off the rest of these Prince Rupert's droplets. And so we see the colored droplets do work as well. I did have a harder time getting droplets out of those compared to the clear glass, but generally it is about a 50% success rate. Whoops, I forgot to put on my gloves. Even though the droplet didn't hurt me, as a teacher, it's good to demonstrate the correct safety procedures. Speaking of which, if you are interested in lamp working, I have plenty of educational resource here to get you started. Of course, safety is my highest concern. So if you do start a studio, you will have to install a ventilation system as well as use the right safety equipment such as glasses and fireproof your workstation. And with enough practice, you can create a lot of different things from scientific to artistic to functional items. Now to test the borosilicate droplet to see if it'll explode as well. And so I broke the tail and it didn't seem to do much. This harder glass compared to soda lime has a coefficient of expansion three times lower, which means it expands and contracts three times less to thermal expansion. We've now reached the end of the video. So thank you for watching this episode on the Prince Rupert's Droplet. I'll leave you with the eerie sounds the molten glass makes when it meets water. And again, this is one of those observations you would miss out on by just reading about it. Or maybe you see a video on it, but they just cut those sounds out so you can hear the narrator.
And so from that first person experience, you get the full spectrum of what is offered. Just like when you hit the subscribe button and change the notification bell to all. That way you're notified of all my uploads. Again, thanks for watching and stay melty.